the U.S. tax system is immensely complicated and has uh, you know, a, a set of reporting requirements which is unknown anywhere else in the world, people take advantage of these provisions in order to uh, reduce their tax burden. But the fact that this is a growing practice does not have any social meaning at all, except that people get spend a lot of time on their tax returns. It certainly doesn't mean that what Piketty and his colleagues have claimed that the bottom 50% of U.S. households have experienced a collapse in their income share simply is not true. Well, I'm James Galbraith, and I teach at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin, where I have been for 33 years now. What uh, Thomas Piketty and his colleagues at the World Inequality Lab have attempted to do is to collect income tax records from a variety of countries uh, and to assess not the inequality of income but the share of the top percentages or, in fact, uh, the shares across the spectrum of incomes in those records. I was asked by the editors of the journal Development and Change to prepare a review of something, that, basically the latest work product of the World Inequality Report 2018. And so I went into the question of how much coverage are you actually able to get and how reliable is it as it compared with other measures. Uh, and the answers to those questions is that the coverage is not as extensive as one would hope for. Uh, and the reason for that is that not all that many countries actually have income tax records. It's also the case that uh, the quality of income tax records is clearly quite variable across countries. India, for example, only 6% of households file income tax, so you're basically forced to heroic measures to estimate what happens in the rest of the country. In Thomas Piketty's home country of France, where in this study and in another, he argues that France was more unequal, had a higher top income share uh, in 1964 than it does today. Uh, I don't know anybody who knows France or who went to school there, as I did a long time ago, who thinks that could possibly be true. In, in 1964, France was a uh, was recovering from the Second World War. It was under the plans. It had large nationalized corporations such as Winnow. Its banks were strictly controlled. It's not that anybody who has seen the Paris real estate market is surely persuaded that it's more unequal today than it was 50 years ago. All methods have disadvantages. And some of the critique that, that Piketty and his colleagues make of household service is justified. Uh, they don't tend to, co to collect the information well on the very wealthy. But that said, uh, there's a lot more information that's available from surveys than there is from tax records. And when you take yet a third source of information, which is payroll records, you find that the estimates that you get from payroll records are generally speaking closer to the broad range of survey estimates than they are to, uh, to Piketty's measures. And it tends to suggest that the tax measures are quite idiosyncratic and should be treated with a great deal of caution. Surveys also tend to be uh, very, uh, can be quite idiosyncratic, and they differ for, uh, in terms of the concept that's being surveyed. Sometimes it's income, sometimes it's expenditure, sometimes it's consumption, sometimes it's gross of tax, sometimes net of tax, or all kinds of different household size adjustments that are in the data. And any two that differ in various ways are going to show different measures of inequality, even for the same data set. The advantage of our approach, which use payroll data, is that it's a single consistent measure. And it's available in considerably greater density, that's to say more country year observations, than any survey-based, uh, and certainly than any of the Piketty uh, tax-based measures, because there's simply much more of the kind of information that we use available as raw material. And it's very easy and inexpensive to calculate the inequality measures. Some of Piketty's data actually shows the same thing, although he doesn't tend to emphasize the stabilization that occurred after 2000. But over a broad array of countries, what one finds is that 1980, you get the debt crisis in Latin America and Africa and Southeast Asia and elsewhere. In the late 1980s, you get the, uh, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the East European um, socialist countries. In the late 1990s, you get the um, uh, Asian crisis. And each of these produces a kind of upsurge of inequality. It then reaches a peak uh, roughly at the time of the NASDAQ boom uh, in the United States, the 9-11 attacks. Interest rates go to zero uh, and commodity prices recover. 
partly because of the very rapid growth in the early 2000s of China's demand for a lot of commodities. So the effect of that shift is a world shift means that the, while inequality levels were much higher in 2000 than they were in 1980, they did tend to come down a bit for an, an, another decade or so. Uh, Latin America, this is associated with the presence of the progressive governments, which have now basically all disappeared. It's true also in Africa, but it's also true, you can see a peaking in China and you can see it in Russia as well. From 1998 onward in Russia, the inequality, which went up dramatically with the collapse of the Soviet Union, stabilizes. So that's a sign of, uh, of the stabilization of the society, which is obvious from the fact that uh, you know, the Russian economy and society has recovered substantially from the catastrophe of the, of the 1990s. In the case of United States data, uh, I think the World Inequality Lab uh, has made fairly serious misinterpretations. Uh, one of them is that uh, in 1986, the United States enacted a major tax reform, which increased the reporting requirements on the top 1% while re lowering the rates. That was the purpose of the tax reform. It shows up in the data as an increase in their share, and it should be corrected for. When you make that correction, you realize the U.S. is not exceptional compared to the U.K. or Canada, uh, other countries which have good reporting of capital incomes. And so stories about inequality which make the U.S. into an exceptional case, they really don't hold up. And in one place in the report, it says the U.S. has exceptionally unequal educational system. Well, first of all, it's not true. And secondly, uh, it, there's no evidence that the U.S. is dramatically different from other Anglo-Saxon countries in that respect. The issue of the bottom 50% is a, a story which was investigated by another very good economist in this area, Stephen Rose. Um, and what Steve found was that the uh, World Inequality Lab team had uh, basically misinterpreted U.S. tax data. They had taken tax filers who are very numerous, as though they were households who were considerably less numerous. A substantial difference in the, uh, uh, in the numbers, uh, more than 100 million in the numbers of tax filers as compared to households. And when you look at the bottom 50% of tax filers, their average income is on the order of 6,500 or something like that. It's a very low number. So there's very little in the report, very little information in the world about wealth inequality, in part because wealth is not uh, a well-defined economic concept. Income, well, Income, you can, in a survey, you can define it. If you're using tax data, well, the law tells you what your income is. If you're using payroll data, well, there's a clearly defined concept of what the a company is paying out, an establishment is paying out uh, in payroll. But with wealth, uh, it, does it include housing wealth, retirement, security, for example, in, public, uh, in a public pension fund? Or is it just, are we just talking about financial wealth? It's very hard to make a consistent set of comparisons across countries. I think there is uh, an important decision that the economics profession needs to make. Inequality research has been largely held over as a form of microeconomics. But in fact, what we found looking when we built up a consistent uh, data set on the world scale is that there are patterns that operate across countries and are common across time. These are macro patterns. It says that the dispersion of a distribution and its mean are not separate phenomena. They are part of the functioning of the global economy. Uh, and I think it, this tells you in a very strong way that economics needs to function at the global level. It needs to focus on how global policies are set. And the most important policies are financial policies. They're the financial regimes that govern the global economy. Bretton Woods into the early 1970s, the functioning of a floating exchange rate system, and then the, basically the dollar-based system, which has emerged since then. These are the debt-driven character of global growth is the same thing as the rise and ebb of inequality. So it seems to me that one has to really develop a global macroeconomics in which inequality is a part. And once you do that, you say, well, all this you know, attention to, to microeconomics, what's it good for? Well, maybe some side questions. But the essential question, which is who gets what, which is the big question in economics, turns out is as much a macro question as inflation, unemployment, uh, the growth rate, and other questions that are typically part of macro.